So, welcome to live from Oslo for uh, for ACTA or Barcelona at Barcelona. Thank you uh, for coming, and just going to get started and jump in. Hopefully, this will help be useful for all the folks here and show you some of the stuff that the Oslo Group has done during the last six months uh, with some various presentations about what has changed, what has been added, um, that can hopefully help your developer experience uh, be that much better. Various other folks will jump on. As I as I go through some slides, so that they can present their part. Uh, let's get started. So, what is Oslo for people that don't actually know? It's not just a place in Oslo. I mean, in Norway, uh, it is actually a bunch of smart people that have helped out with many different things in OpenStack. Probably a very uh, many years of experience in OpenStack. I myself have done five years, I think. Probably others have similar amount of time. Uh, trying to improve a lot of the high quality uh, components that back OpenStack, for example, the messaging layer, uh, the database layer, some workflow management tools, some helper libraries for uh, state machines, for example, just a lot of utility code as well, uh, all sort of built out of many years of experience from the various OpenStack projects, isolating it as much as we can into high quality libraries that we can share, not just with OpenStack, but with the rest of the world. Uh, this has turned out pretty well, I think. We've got, got a lot of useful tools and uh, components that other projects have started to use as well. So let's go into what happened for the next, uh, yeah, for Newton. Uh, what do we have from some of the high level is we have some mutable configuration that was done as a way to uh, make it easier to change configuration on demand. Uh, there's a messaging backend that we're going to go into quite a bit of detail on. I think there's even a whole, a whole presentation on it next in the next uh, next hour. Yep, right. Next next session here. Uh, there's this new concept of policy and code for those who wonder what that is. It may hopefully it'll become a little more obvious in a little bit, but it's a useful. Uh, layer to connect the sort of the disconnected policy that was in files, move it closer to where it's actually used. Of course, there's been a lot of uh, bug fixing, various tweaks to the code itself, uh, various releases of requirement updates. Those are the, our favorite. And uh, yeah, thanks to the release team, this has all made it been a lot easier than it was previously. Now it's more of just the submit a YAML file, and the rest happens pretty much automatically. So thanks to Doug and Theory and I think Dims who helped out make that possible. So let's jump into some of the changes here. Uh, is Alexis around? Oh, OK, we're good. So oh wait, let's jump in. I think let me try turning this off and see what happens here. All right. Hi there. Uh, hi, so usable config, uh, also known as reloadable config. Uh, what is it? It's a way to reload your config options when you send a sig up to a process. Uh, this is handy for multiple reasons I'll get into on the next slide. Uh, a word of warning, each project and each option must be enabled. This is a huge pain, but it's unavoidable, I'm afraid. So what's it good for? Uh, API uptime, if you don't want your API servers being unavailable for a few seconds when you reload your config. Uh, incremental development, uh, developers often need to just play around to hone in on what the right setting for something is. And of course, when you're diagnosing a fault, sometimes if you restart the service, the fault goes away and then you can't look at it. So which options support it? Only a few so far, more are coming. Uh, we, in Oslo log, we've got default debug and uh, default log config append. In Nova, we have libvirt live migration completion timeout and the progress timeout as well. Uh, in Akata, a few more live migration options are happening, and I hope that more Nova options will come through in time. So the big one here is log config append. This is a sample log conf. It's very small. I hope you can read some of that. Um, these can get much bigger, much more complicated. Each of the things you see in here, so the loggers, the handlers, the formatters, they all have some options. You might have a custom date format in here. You might want to add a JSON formatter. Uh, now, all you have to do is change your logging conf, send a sig up to the processes, and they will automatically pick that up. 
This means that you can change log levels. You can add a JSON logger, as I said. If you want to start using FluentD, you can do that all without any API downtime. So this part is more for the developers among you. Hopefully there's a few out there. Uh, enabling mutable config in your project. This is the easy bit. You just add restart method mutate to your process launcher or service launcher. Uh, this assumes that you're using Oslo service, because why wouldn't you? But if you're not, then uh, you just need to make sure that you call the new Oslo config uh, mutate, I think it's called mutate config options, rather than the old reload config options method. Uh, enabling options, also pretty easy. Just add mutable true, but there's a catch. Uh, sometimes, maybe you can see in this code, options are cached. So the value is taken outside a loop and then it's used inside the loop. But the actual, the actual option isn't checked again because it's cached in this local variable. This is unsafe. If you reload your config, it won't affect your live state. So, pretty simple, move it inside the loop. Some cases that won't be quite so obvious, but in this case it was easy. Uh, yeah, simple as that. Now, now the option is checked every time from the conf config option and it will take effect. Things can also be cached externally. So for example, when you set your log level, that's what I would call an external cache for your log level. So in that case, you need to register a mutate hook, and then every time your config is reloaded, all of the mutate hooks will run, and you can check for your options changing and reset your state. Oh, I pressed the thing. Make it stop. Yeah, good enough. And that's it. Right. Next up is Ken, who's going to go over some of the new messaging components in the back end that is pretty powerful. It uh, got merged really, pretty recently, and so it's hopefully yes, it's, it's developer, ready. developer ready for experimentation and so on. Thank you. Hi. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about new, a new messaging back end. How did that just happen? Ah, you got it. That's like demons. Um, we're talking about a new messaging backend. Let me go straight ahead and say, no, it is not another broker. We are full up on the broker department. This is different technology. And that's scary. I'm going to use this. OK, so before I talk about it, it makes sense to talk a little bit about Oslo messaging so you can kind of understand where its best fit is in the uh, messaging uh, deployment. So there's two uh, patterns offered by Oslo messaging, remote procedure call, RPC, and notifications with PubSub. These are very popular patterns, but they're very different in terms of implementation. A remote procedure call is, uh, is a synchronous exchange of data between two uh, entities, right? The client makes a call, the call goes to the server, the server replies, and you're done. But they have to be present at the same time in order for this to work, right? So they're tightly coupled in time if the server isn't there, the client's going to fail, the call's going to fail. Contrast, sorry, contrast with notifications. Um, notifications is more of an asynchronous pattern. Notifiers can issue uh, notification messages and they have no concern of when they're consumed. So it could be totally asynchronous. The notifications can come, the notifiers can go away, and at some later point, listeners come in. This pattern, whenever you have two messaging entities that are separated by time, you must have store and forwarding. You must use queuing. This is perfect, and this is the reason why we use a broker. However, if you look at the way we actually implement, it, implement this on a broker, it's, it's not optimal for um, RPCs. This could be any broker, by the way. It's not just RabbitMQ, it's certainly CupidD. Um, so if we look at the notifications, I, as I already explained, notifications get put on a queue, the notifiers can go away, the notification or listens comes in. It's a very efficient transfer of information. However, RPC, mm, um, it takes four transfers and two queuing operations, uh, actually four queuing operations, to do one single RPC, right? The request comes into the broker, it's queued on the broker, but the broker then acknowledges it, which means the client has no visibility into whether or not that message was actually consumed. Eventually, it travels to the end of the queue, is pulled off by an RPC server, RPC server, which acknowledges it back to the broker. 
server processes, replies, again queued, again act, sent across the queue, sucked up by the RPC client, and then it can act. So it's a lot of work for a broker to do compared to notifications. We have different options. In also messaging, uh, I think since Liberty perhaps, uh, maybe Mataka, I'm not sure. You can configure different backends for the different patterns. You can have one backend for RPC servers and one for notification listeners. You can use a broker, you can use ZMQ. There's plenty of different type of technologies. And what I'm gonna talk about is this new technology from the Apache Cupid group. This is a new messaging infrastructure component. It's not a replacement to a broker. It's different, it complements a broker. Um, think it's a router for, at the message level. It routes on messaging addresses. So think of an IP router, but instead of routing on IP addresses, it learns subscribers, learns the addresses of those subscribers, and takes the messages that are addressed to the subscribers and efficiently forwards them through um, the net. And as you can see, it's optimally deployed as an internet, interconnected network. You can use it singly, but you don't leverage any of the um, high availability and scalability that I'm going to talk about very quickly here. Um, yes, not a broker. Big difference, it does no queuing, all right? It does some buffering when it's sending messages across, but it never accepts the message. It never acts the message on behalf of the client. Uh, the message is sent into the mesh, and it hops until it gets to its destination. The acknowledgement from the client, when it's done and it acknowledges the message, or perhaps a NAC, it gets hopped back, okay? It will NAC a message when it determines that it cannot get further. So if we're hopping along a path and then it, can't, it turns out the path is broken, it will send back a NAC on behalf of the, um, the, the, the recipient. And that is a, uh, a true delivery status. That means if you have an acknowledgement, you know the message was consumed. Likewise, if you have a NAC, you know you can recover from that. You can retransmit. In sense, in terms of messaging, it's completely stateless. It doesn't keep any messaging state that needs to be restored after a reboot. So these things can go down, come up, and they learn. Totally dy dynamic. Same patterns, unicast, multicast, and balanced as a broker. Um, like I said, everything is dynamic. It basically learns the topology of the network and computes and learns as subscribers come and go. And it uses a shortest path algorithm with linked cost. Uh, so the field layer recovery is a little different, all right? It, it, just like the IP internet, it routes around failures. It will use a higher cost path, perhaps, if a lower cost path fails. Uh, it's all dynamic. Nobody has to pre-configure these things. Um, so high availability is not uh, achieved via clustering or anything high level. There's no external synchronization uh, system that needs to be deployed. All the routers are peers. They talk to each other. There's no master router. There's no split brain. You can have degraded performance as things fall down. But once they heal again, you're back to where you started from. Okay, so here's a quick example. RPC client, RPC server speaking from the mesh along this red line. This is the optimal path. Should a link fail, it's transparent to the RPC client. The routers readjust to a less optimal path, but still functional. Should a router get poofed out of existence, uh, you see actually two things here, because I didn't have an internal router in this picture. Could be transparent to the client if it was, but in this case, also messaging has the ability to fail over. So you can have two connections, uh, a backup connection, for instance. So we have two things going on here. We have a backup from the library, um, a failover in the library, and also a new path computation. Uh, the other interesting thing is the low, there's more opportunity for parallelism, right? Um, and since these things are dynamic, you can add routers to increase your messaging scale, and you can remove them when you don't need it without service interruption. And if there are alternate paths and two communicating parties don't intersect at a router, you actually do get true parallelism in the message flow. So this is what you can do in Newton. Like I said, we can configure RPCs to use one back and, and, and notifications use other. Continue using notifications for a broker. Your, your option now is to uh, use RPC via uh, the AMQP transport um, and take advantage of the message bus. In the future, and this is actually part of the Cupid project, not necessarily the also stuff. In the future, you'll be able to use brokers as a service within the mesh. So the notifiers and, and listeners won't connect directly to the broker, but they'll be routed intelligently to the broker because they need store and forwarding, whereas RPCs can go direct. And Yes, meeting downstairs right after this. Also messaging documentation explains how to use it. Um, configure it, play with it in, in, in um, dev stack, or if you want to deploy it. Um, information about the dispatch router is up at the QP Apa Apache Cupid, and we're, Andy and I have been working on the driver stuff. Uh, we're in OpenStack, Oslo, Pound, KGUSD, and Smith. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. So the next up is uh, our policy and code editions that are uh, used in Nova and I think are getting deployed elsewhere. So here you go. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chan Mokuo. Uh, I got GCB. Uh, the Oslo Policy Library provides uh, support for role-based uh, access, access control policy enforcement uh, across all OpenStack services. In Newton release, there are two important uh, updates. The first one is the, we, uh, the Oslo policy library support uh, policy file in YAML file. The main work was done by Brant Nudersen. Uh, uh, the JSON format uh, is a subset of uh, YAML. So the current uh, policy file in JSON, file, uh, JSON format uh, are still su supported. Uh, when we use uh, uh, YAML format, we can add comments in the policy file. Then we can uh, explain what does the rule mean. So that's a, ba uh, that's a benefit. The, another important update is the policy in code. The mini work was done by Andrew Lasky. I re have reviewed most of the comments. Uh, so. Uh, before Newton, there are some drawbacks. First, the employers must provide all policy rules in policy file. The other drawback is there's no way to discover what rules are checked in. For example, in NOAA, for evacuate operation, uh, that, uh, that's the only admin sister can operate. So we we do, uh, we reject the policy defaults in code. There are some benefits. The first one is uh, the employers only need to provide a policy file if, if, if he wants to override something. If he don't want to override the default rules, he don't, uh, doesn't need to provide a policy file. Uh, in this the Newton release, uh, we can generate a sample file uh, with, a with a tool. Then we can know what exactly the rules are checking in the code. We also provide uh, a tools to generate a po effective policy to combine the uh, default rules and the rules loading from policy file. That means uh, we, can, we call it an effective policy rule. The last one, we can list redundant uh, policy defined in file, and uh, then we can remove the duplicate one. Okay. There are three, there are four command line interfaces. The first one is Oslo sample generator. We can uh, get, uh, need two arguments. First is the application name. Here, for example, is NOAA. Then we put, put an output file, uh, direct the file path to output. If we omitted the opted file, the file will be uh, was sent to sender arrow, send out. Another command line is policy policy generator. Uh, the difference uh, between the sample generator and the policy generator, the policy generator will combine the default, default rules and the rules from the policy file. Then we have Oslo policy list redundant. It will list duplicate rules in the file. The last one is a test tool, Oslo policy checker. It, uh, there, are three, there are four uh, arguments. First, the, the policy file. Then access means the access information, usually including Username, project ID, uh, it's admin, it's optional. Rule argument uh, is also uh, optional. If we provide the rule, it will show all the rule. So how to adopt ER projects? Uh, first, we got a uh, if our instance. Then we reject uh, some default rules. The 
uh, rule defaults have three arguments. The first is the rule name. For example, here is the admin required. It's the rule name. Then the real rule. Here is row admin. Or it's admin equals true. Uh, opposite argument is the description. Here is who is considered as admin. The, op the description can be used to generate a sample file. Then we use the false redress the policy rules like this. And the last, there are some more information you can reference. The first is the author spec, uh, how to explain the policy in code. The other is the described sample generator. The last one is the NOAA adopted the Oslo policy. So you can try this for get more information. Thank you. All right, next up we have uh, about more about Zero MQ. So another Oslo messaging one. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Alexey Zametin, and I'm going to make a short update of uh, what was done in Newton for Zero MQ driver. So as Ken pointed out, uh, the optimal message bus looks like, he, li like this. Uh, so we, we have RPC client connected directly to RPC server, and that's uh, what you can have with ZeroMQ. So how, how to uh, make use of ZeroMQ driver? Uh, so uh, the main thing, you, you have to specify the transport URL with ZeroMQ prefix in your code, uh, in, in your config, and um, this URL points to an AIM service, uh, which we use for uh, matchmaking clients to, to servers uh, in ZeroMQ, and generally it's Redis. And other options are, uh, you, you may specify them optionally, uh, and they uh, configure the driver uh, in the ways I, I will describe in following slides. So, uh, on this slide you, you can see the d direct connections configuration. Uh, there are two bad things about direct connections. Uh, the first thing is that uh, you will have a lot of uh, connections on some centralized services like Neutron Server or uh, Nova Conductor, Nova Scheduler. So uh, to optimize this, we've made those connections dynamic. Uh, that means that you open connections for request and close it after request. And, uh, this way is, uh, takes uh, some overhead uh, by connecting and disconnecting, but you have uh, quite optimal number of connections. And the other thing is uh, on the uh, configurations uh, on the left side, uh, uh, we have uh, slow fan out because uh, the client need to connect to all the services to make fan out. So on the right side, uh, you, you can see the mixed uh, configuration with uh, pops-up uh, usage. So it, it uh, uses publisher proxy, sorry, um, to send fan out. And uh, this second configuration is uh, quite optimal from you know, connections number and uh, from the performance perspective. So I, I'd recommend this for a big scale. And. Uh, if you don't like dynamic connections and you want to have some predictable number of connections, you may use static connections. But then you uh, need to use proxies because static connections are uh, like getting accumulated with direct connections. So we, we need proxies to optimize this number. And here we also have two uh, possibilities to uh, uh, use uh, simply routing, then again, uh, the client is in charge of doing fan out. Uh, and we can use uh, pops up for fan out, but then we, we have more connections. So uh, that's uh, the, the, the two main problems of message queue scaling is performance and connections numbers. So we, we have uh, so many <laughs> uh, configurations to, to optimize those things to, to find the balance between those problems. And uh, here I've listed uh, those configurations and highlighted the ones I'd recommend to use on a big scale. Uh, 
Uh, here is a short summary of uh, features that were added or something changed in Newton release. And uh, thanks to all contributors to ZeroMQ driver. And if you need more info, you can follow those links. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I guess we can open up for questions. We also wanted to put out a couple of links out there uh, where various meetings are for the Oslo team, just in case people want to jump in and get active. Uh, there's the team meeting, which we have weekly. Um, I forget the UTC time, but it's on Monday. Uh, we have the OpenStack Oslo IRC, of course, and uh, we have a bunch more sessions tomorrow and Thursday, uh, more of design sessions, not presentations. But, uh, people are welcome to jump in on the various topics. You can, cl you can click on that and see what those are. Uh, any questions from folks that we can answer uh, about new features or policy, po policy and code or any of the other topics that are, are useful for folks? One quick question about sure. the, the rotor-based messaging. What's the performance in terms of detecting failure? Oh, I'm sorry. I've been told I have a big enough mouth, so maybe this is. Um, connection failure, uh, it depends on the type of failure, right? If you have a, a link go down, for example, that's immediate, and the router will start broadcasting changes in the topology. Um, it all, there's also, uh, well, it's running a routing protocol, which includes hellos. So if the TCP connection doesn't immediately fail, but there's a problem downstream past the proxy, that will time out. Now, that's configurable. I think the default is three seconds uh, without hearing a hello or three hellos or something like that. But all that is configurable. So there's immediate failure and non-reachability failures. Say very little bit. Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to ask anything Oslo-related. Yeah. Oh. So if 0MQ and the yeah. If 0MQ and Cupid were to fight, who would win? Yeah. Well, I have a fix in on Cupid. No, this, this is not the Cupid broker. You're, you're talking about routing versus ZMQ, right? Yeah, they, they both seem useful for RPC. Yes. So as a complete newbie to Oslo messaging, I was just wondering what the recommendation is. I might be a little biased. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to say is you go with what works for you. I think that a lot of the small configurations or using a single broker is fine. Rabbit's been the most tested and well, most well known, so you're probably with that. The stuff that I was talking about, this router stuff, is gonna be adopted by the, the high end. If you come to the meeting we have downstairs, we'll kind of show how you could grow a geographical mesh and connect different offices, right? Different deployment centers together using it and managing it. Uh, I'm gonna do a demo of the management stuff too. Um, in terms of ZMQ versus this, ZMQ is directly over TCP. It's going to be really, really fast. So there's very little latency. All right? Obviously, when you go through a network, you're going to have latency for every jump, every, draw, every hop across. And that will vary with load. I'm sorry. Um, on my laptop, for example, um, just doing a low, a low. Uh, Thank you. I'm a software guy. I don't know hardware. Um, Latency is in the tens of microseconds across, in and out, under, not under load, and it starts to vary a little bit. This router has been, this is totally separate from OpenStack. This has been, it's about two years now being used in the field by other projects, like OpenShift. Red Hat uses this for satellite, um, and there's various upstream people who are using it. Uh, so we're not exactly where we want to be with performance, right? The goal is to get it and keep it under 100 uh, microseconds per transfer, but that's going to add up. If you have TCP going directly, if that's, that's about as fast as you can get, right? But there may be reasons why, why you can't get TCP connectivity, specifically that geographical change, right? These routers can serve as IP bridges. They can take two subnets and bridge across them transparently to the, um, to the client. So you can have two unroutable subnets connected via a router acting as a bridge. You don't need TCP connectivity, right? So maybe that might change you know, your needs. If I were you, I'd evaluate both. I'd evaluate all three, right? It's good to have choices, and you can figure out where you want to go from there. But certainly, ZMQ is wonderful. This, uh, hopefully, this will be as good as ZMQ, <laughs> or see that kind of adoption. 
That's great. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thanks. All right, question. Seems kind of good well, right there, by the way. <laughs> one, one more question on the router. What would be your recommended configuration? Where do those routers get deployed? Do I need one per compute node? Do I need one per data center? Again, I, I, what we're envisioning is, um, depending on the size of your data center, one or two in the data center, two for fault tolerance, and then you know interconnects to other data centers using two, four. Come to the meeting, um, sorry, the presentation will I talk about that stuff. I think that what's well, another useful thing for me is that there's make sure you there's two di distinguishing drivers like there's the RPC one and the notification one. You may want to pick different tech. Well, at least uh, what GoDaddy is doing, we're looking into using Kafka for the notification one, and we can use RPC. You can pick from one of these two. So there's there's diversity and depends on your requirements, sort of where you want to go with it in reality to see where you which driver you want to use, which ones may be appropriate, what the rest of the community is using, that kind of stuff. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, folks, for showing up. We have uh, more sessions next soon about the Oslo messaging uh, AMQP driver, and we have lots of design sessions tomorrow. So see you all there.